Hello again. Uh, this is Pastor Robin Martins again for Kindred Park uh, Community Church live stream. I hope that I didn't lose everybody. Just a small glitch there. You know, software never works quite as well as you want it to work when you need it to work. So here we are again. I hope that I am also the uh, right uh, rotation here. Um, that I'm not sideways. Uh, looks like we got a person watching and just need you to comment if I am uh, turned sideways or if I'm the right way. And if you can actually hear me would be very helpful right now. I'm sorry that uh, I can't check this uh, in advance. So I am being heard and I am the right uh, rotation. So portrait, landscape, I'm not sideways and all that. So we're looking good. All right, why don't we uh, begin? I hope that others who I may have disconnected can connect in and if you're new, and uh, if you're new uh, to this here, my name is uh, Robin Martins. I get to be the pastor of uh, Kinnard Park Community Church in Castlegar. The very interesting thing is that I actually live here in Victoria, and due to the pestilence that we are experiencing in Canada and in the world, I am quarantined here in uh, Victoria. And so we are live streaming for Kinnard Park Community Church, and I'm doing this from Victoria. I'm glad that you could be here. So I just want to say, hey, hello, Kinnard Park Community Church. Hello to the church family. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So may God, may our God bless you as you worship him this morning in spirit and in truth. I do have a brief announcement before we proceed. Uh, our very own Rachel Schmidt, Schmidt, pardon me, has provided a resource, resource link for us uh, to a simple plan for engaging the message of Easter with our family. So get this, we get to experience it with all five senses. So if this is something for you, uh, it sounds good. And I think it sounds great. Uh, look back at our last order of worship that came out through our church newsletter and you will find a link there. So I just want to thank you, Rachel, for doing this for us. Why don't we take a brief uh, time here and uh, play, uh, play. <laughs> Let's take a brief time and pray together. I've got my family sitting in front of me here on the couches in our living room. And no, they don't have their cornflakes and house coats on. They're all dressed up as if they were going to go to church. And so I do have somebody to look at rather than just myself and the camera. But I do want to take some time and pray together. And I want us to remember our dear brother, uh, Morris York, and his wife, Marilyn. Morris suffered a heart attack this past week and they are awaiting his surgery in Kelowna this week. He is in good spirits. He's definitely had some discouraging moments and who wouldn't, but he's in good spirits. They are trusting Jesus and are grateful for your prayers and words. Uh, we can see our Father's hand all over this crisis. Uh, he is greater than it. He is greater than all things. And the Yorks have some great stories to share with us about that. So keep praying for them. So let us together bow our heads for a moment of prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for our Kennard Park family, church family. We want to thank you for every church uh, all around the world, for all of your people who are gathering in your name. Uh, we just thank you for this privilege and this opportunity that we can do this through technology. And we just want to lift up Maris, <laughs> Maris, Morris and Marilyn. I am not getting my words right today, but we lift up Morris and Marilyn. Uh, to you and we just pray for your strength to continue to them your encouragement to them for your spirit to continually fall afresh upon them and to encourage their hearts that you are their loving father you are in complete control of this situation it is beyond our understanding we may wonder why in these times but we know that you are a good father and uh, that uh, you will work everything out for their good, uh, for their blessing, and for the for their joy, and really for all of your people. So we pray you continue to uh, to encourage them. We pray for healing. We pray for uh, a, 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 a good surgery, wisdom to the doctors, and the guiding of their hands uh, through this time. In Jesus' name, and Father, we just want to pray for our town, Castlegar, and I pray, well, for my city, Victoria, as I'm still here in Victoria, we just pray during this time of uncertainty, of fear, of wondering what is going to happen. Father God, uh, some of us aren't too worried. Some of us are really worried. There's a broad range. There's some of us who should be worried more than we are worried, uh, more than we are, and there's some of us who maybe are too worried about this. And we just pray, though, nonetheless, for people to uh, sense your spirit today to sense uh, the living God who is present, who is near, and who cares. 
We pray for our country and our world in this way, Father. We just want to ask that Jesus be sought and be found uh, by everyone, for he is near to those who reach for him. He is not far from us. Uh, we just thank you for this amazing truth, and we pray that it will be realized by many more today, many more through this uh, pandemic. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we will be uh, looking at uh, or beholding Jesus' identity and his purpose through his passion narrative. This will be found in Mark cha Mark cha uh, Mark's Gospel account, chapters 14 to 15. This will be part one of our Easter series. I'm not exactly sure how many parts we're going to have in this under the circumstances, but just to be ready, if you have a Bible and you are familiar with it, open it to Mark chapter 14. If you do not have a Bible and you're not sure really how to operate one and you're not that familiar with it, that is okay. Just listen along and I'll do the reading for you. So uh, here we are. Um, the question I want to ask you this morning as we gather here is, have you ever stood back as much as a finite uh, being can do this, have you ever stood back and wondered, what's it all about? Have you ever asked the purpose question? Maybe you're not the deeper deeper thinking type. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you live a happy-go-lucky life, you enjoy everything, and those bigger life questions aren't on your spiritual radar. Well, it's true. There are different types of people. Uh, we're a human mosaic. Uh, we're not all the same, and that is good, for we need that diversity in each other to keep a healthy equilibrium uh, in our culture and society and in our relationships with one another. It's how life has been designed. The deeper thinkers press their let-live neighbors to realize life is not all fun and games, and the let-live type push their deeper thinking friends to relax and to simply enjoy the simpler things of life. Uh, today, given the season that it is, we need to give the microphone to the deeper thinker. Yes, you're looking at a deeper thinker right now. That's me. And all of us need to stop, focus, and listen very careful, carefully to the bigger issues and questions of life. So that's what we're doing today. So the deeper thinker gets the microphone today, and we've, we've got to listen up uh, to what the deeper thinker needs to say. Um. So what is life in this world, in this vast cosmos all about? What is the purpose of it all? Well, let's ratchet up the tension of that question several notches. Given all the evil, suffering, and death plaguing, human, plaguing humankind on every level of our existence, what is the point of it all? Many of us uh, can't connect with that question because life seems like it's going pretty good for us so far. So we're just not feeling the need to go there. We're not wanting to go there. We just don't go there. Things are just too good. However, we don't realize that we live in the eye of the storm. And trouble of some sort, like the current virus right now, is going to come. The writer of Ecclesiastes spoke of the yo-yo effect of life. There is a season for everything, up and down, good and bad, and we all have to learn to live through all those seasons. And so we have our let-live folks in the good times to help us laugh and enjoy ourselves, and we have the deeper thinkers when things aren't going so good to help us understand what's going on and how to press on through that in faith in our great God. We need both. Yet, we have to understand that life because we live in a fallen world, is, for the most part, a disaster. Just read the headlines. Just look around you. We can, we can even just think about our own lives. You know, I can see the train wreck and the disaster that my life is at times. And so, yeah, just look around you. Life is a disaster. And, and, and what happened way back in Genesis chapter 3 in the storyline has never let up. We may have seasons where we don't feel it quite as much, seasons where we are ignoring it and finding ways to distract ourselves and medicate ourselves, but Genesis 3 has never let up. And today we have to wrestle with the bigger life question, what is the point of it all? But seeing that we're all finite, who would actually know? Who would have the, the answer to that question? Like, who is qualified to answer a question like that? What is it all about? What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose? Who is qualified for that? Who has their credentials to take that question up and ask and answer it for us? Well, there is one who knows all things. And who is that? Yes, you guessed it. It is God. But how does God help, some people might ask? For example, where is God in all the trouble and chaos of life? 
If he is so powerful and good, why hasn't he stopped all the pain and suffering in the world? So why would we even want to think about God? Well, this is where we need a good reminder of the Fuller Bible storyline. It begins like this. Originally, God made a very good world. Way back in the beginning, it was very good. Early on, through our first parents, we decided that we could stand in God's place over ourselves, so God gave us over to what we wanted. Just think about that. We parents, we warn our children, we command them as much as we can, and we say, don't do this, don't go there, you know, avoid this, avoid that. But there comes a point sometimes when they're just going to do it, and we have to kind of let them step out and give them over to that. And that's what God did for us. We thought, hey, we can be God for ourselves. We can determine what's right and wrong. And so God gives us over to what we wanted. And we've been doing this ever since. And we need to know that this is the reason for all of our troubles in the disastrous place that we're in as the human race. I had a neighbor uh, back when we lived in Abbotsford. He had what he thought was a good life. Uh, however, that was turned upside down by a car accident and a back injury. He wasn't paralyzed, but he could no longer work. And not being able to work uh, anymore is a very difficult thing to face. One day he discovered that I was a pastor, that I was religious, and he expressed an interest in that, that he needed something deeper, that he needed something more. And so we talked over time. Sadly, as we talked uh, and as time went on, more bad things began to happen to him. One day he says to me, as soon as I start believing in God, then all this bad stuff starts happening. You know, what gives? I don't see the point of carrying on the, the, the conversation about religion any longer. And I responded to him. Ultimately, I can't explain all that bad stuff to you. I don't think any human being can. But I do know this. Jesus, God's son, fully stepped into our shoes and he hit, and he hit evil head on at the cross. Um, you can carry on taking your own life into your own hands. But you need to know this you will continue to lose it piece by piece and bit by bit until there is nothing left. Or you can turn to Jesus who rose from the dead and let him bring you through it. So what's the point? Of ourselves, there would be no point. It would be a hopeless, lost cause. But then comes Jesus. He arrives on the world scene. He has an amazing ministry, doing good to all, healing people and proclaiming eternal hope. But Jewish, a jealous Jewish religious uh, and uh, leaders and controlling Roman authorities uh, arrest Jesus. They try Jesus. They condemn Jesus without any evidence. And they murder Jesus without cause. Thus, coming to the passion narrative of Jesus, and the passion narrative of Jesus simply refers to his suffering and his death, that last week or so of his life. So coming to the passion narrative of Jesus, we might see no answer in it. It is chaotic, evil, unjust, greedy, jealous, and a dark blanket is over the entire scene. If there ever was a time when everything looked most out of control, this was it. Apparently, not even God can handle this crazy world. Moreover, those who had repented and followed after Jesus were scattered and shattered. There was nothing worse that could happen in their eye, in their, in their, in their view. Again, if you're wondering what the point of all of it could be in the darkest stretch of Jesus' life, and I say the darkest stretch of world history, here it is. The passion narrative is typically where the gospel accounts slow right down and are much more drawn out. There's a lot more detail going on here. It, it slows down from su uh, summary to now we're basically following Jesus day by day here. There is so much to those final chapters that we can't cover, but what I want to do is simplify it down to two very big truths for us. And so here we are. This is where we need to go to um, the Passion Narrative in Mark's Gospel account, chapters 14 to 15. And the first big truth that we see is in, like I said, in chapter 14, and uh, I want to go with you to verse uh, chapter 14 to verse 61 in uh, Mark chapter 14. Like I said, if you're not, you don't have a Bible and you're not sure what to do, just listen along. So Mark chapter 4, 14, verses uh, 61 to uh, 64. And so just a little bit of context here. Jesus is, has been arrested. He's before the uh, Jewish court. And they're leveling all sorts of charges against them, false charges they can't 
prove charges uh, and testimonies that don't even agree with each other at all. And he's remaining silent under this questioning. And the high priest asks him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witness do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. They never denied that Jesus, I mean, that, that, that the Christ would be the Son of God. They just rejected that Jesus fit that bill and could take that role. But anyways, what we see here, what we've, we just read, is that in the complete chaos and evil of this situation, the truth about who Jesus is rises to the surface and takes the pedestal. Until now, Jesus never verbally revealed his identity. Rather, he did it by his life. He demonstrated who he was in spades by his life. Everyone knew his words and deeds, that he spoke and did what only God could say and do. And you and I, we can go back and read all of that. In the darkest times, we rebellious, darkened, lost people at the end of ourselves are in the best place to see the truth about Jesus. Here is our God who loves us, demonstrating his love by allowing us to do to him uh, what we did without responding in wrath. You may say, well, I never did that to Jesus. I never would have done that. We have to realize that we're no different from those people back there. We are cut from the same cloth. We are pinched off from the same clay. We're the same material. We're the same people. We would have done what they've done. We either would have abandoned him or we would have condemned him. So here he is. God's demonstrating his love for us that by allowing us to do to him what we did without wrath. And he will judge the world, but he first wants us to see what he is truly like. And he is love. So that's the first big truth there. The, uh, that Jesus' identity rises to the surface in his passion narrative. Uh, the second big truth I want to look at with you is in chapter 15 of Mark, and I want to look at verses 33 and on uh, with you. So read with me, uh, Mark chapter 15, verses 33 and following. And so Jesus has just been through the, uh, the Roman court now, and he has been uh, condemned uh, without uh, without cause, like I said, he's been scourged and beaten, and now he has been crucified, and he's up on the cross. And the text starts this way, And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I just want to skip down a bit here to uh, verse 37 and 38. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Jesus faces the complete chaos and evil of this situation. And it is a chaotic and evil situation. It is a, just a time of darkness. And he fully bears that on himself. And he is doing this for us. He's doing this for you and me. He is dying the death that we deserve. Every bad thing we face in this life is because we are fallen creatures in a fallen world. We deserve hell. We deserve this. Yet Jesus takes it on himself at the cross and by the rending of the temple veil, he shows that the way is fully open for you and me to return to our God who loves us and would rather save us than judge us. After a lot of gruesome human history, God himself arrives on the world scene. He personally steps into the middle of all the world's troubles. He fully put on human nature and our God fully hits evil, suffering, and death head on at the cross and he takes it out forever in the person and work of Jesus. The drawn out Intense, dark, otherwise hopeless passion narrative of Jesus, really, like I said, it represents, it represents all of us at our worst under Satan's sway, but in it we clearly see who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. This is what the communion table is all about. This is what the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, whatever word we might want to use there, 
It's all about remembering Jesus and what he has done for us, remembering him regularly so that we never forget that uh, uh, who he is and what he's done for us, that you know, we're always remembering that at every step and season of life, every second of every day, this is the one thing that saves us. It's not our good deeds. It's not our good works. It's not our intelligence and smarts. There's nobody good enough and there's nobody smart enough to save themselves. It is by Jesus alone. It is by his dying in our place for us and rising again that we can be utterly forgiven. Not with the hope of being forgiven, but through faith in him being completely forgiven and restored fully to our God forever. That all the wrath, all the condemnation, all the judgment that we in this in our world deserves was taken out upon Jesus. But here's the key. You have to believe. None of it is applied to us until we believe and give ourselves fully over to Jesus. So what I would like to do right now with you is, as we wrap this message up here, um... I would like us to close our eyes and bow our heads as we get ready to respond in prayer. And so why don't we just take a moment and do that. Uh, I wish we could observe communion together this day. I really do. But for now, we can bow our heads together. We can meditate on who Jesus is and what he has done for us. We can let him fill our hearts, continue to wash our sin away every moment and every day to assure us that we are his forever as we submit to him as our Lord, as we learn how to do that. And we can worship him for his great love for us. That's what we really want to do. There is no fear now. We can approach him freely because the temple veil has been torn in two. There's nothing blocking us. That's what that means from coming to our God now. And so why don't we just take this opportunity and pray here. Father, I just thank you, first of all, for those of us who are believing, who are trusting, and who have been reminded of the good news of Jesus that we need to hear. And I just pray you would encourage our hearts and build us up and on this foundation, uh, on this gospel, to remembering that, yes, our salvation is by what Jesus has done for us alone and nothing else. Everything we do comes out of that. Uh, Father, I pray for those who have signed in and who are listening and who have not yet trusted in Jesus, and maybe not everything made sense in this sermon, but I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make known to them what they need to hear now and enable them to understand what they need to understand and to receive what they need to receive at this moment to embrace Jesus or to move one step closer to doing just that. And so I pray they would feel a loving, gracious invitation to come to you, Father, through your Son, Jesus, especially in this time of uncertainty, of fear, of unknown, as something that has risen up against us that we have no real control over. Uh, something that uh, that shows us we're not independent, but that we are fully dependent creatures and we need our God, that we cannot live without you. So I'm praying, move these hearts towards you in grace and love. We thank you, Father God. Uh, you have demonstrated your holiness and your righteousness at the cross and that you do not overlook sin. You do not sweep it under the rug. It was paid in full upon Jesus, a horrific picture of wrath. But we're thankful also that uh, as your justice is displayed at the cross and taken uh, out fully there, your love pours out from the cross. And we're thankful for that. And we just pray for your love to pour over Victoria, over Castlegar, over whatever city and town people are listening to this broadcast from. We pray this for Canada. We pray this for our world. We pray that the imperishable future of our Lord Jesus will just become clear now, something that we will look to and understand and see and embrace, that our home is not in this passing, fading world, but it is in the return of Jesus and the new world and the new creation he is going to bring through his death, through his resurrection. So we thank you for this, Father, and pray that you continue to bless us as we worship you throughout this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, I just want to thank you for joining us. Uh, please continue in the next steps of our online uh, worship liturgy. If you are connected to Kindred Park Community Church, you would have received an email with a newsletter with what to do uh, with the rest of the uh, liturgy. I won't be able to lead you through that because we're going to move into the song section next. And no, I'm not going to pick up a guitar and sing for you right now. That would just kill the worship. I could see the spirit just retreating if I tried to sing. Well, not really. We're all supposed to make a joyful noise to the Lord. And I make a joyful noise, and it is definitely a noise. I don't carry a tune in a bucket, so you don't want me to do that at all. So we have arranged for you, our music team has arranged for you five songs that were released through our newsletter. We do two newsletters per week. One is Family News, and the other is The Order of Worship During This Time of Isolation. And so the songs are there. The YouTube links are there. 
And if you didn't get those, please email us and um, uh, and and uh, you can make use of those songs. Uh, they, they can play them through YouTube and the lyrics come up so you can follow along and you can sing your heart out to our great God and Savior. I encourage you that they're amazing songs. And so that's what's next. Um, and then after the songs are concluded, come back to your email and your order of service and liturgy and just follow through the remaining steps as you close your time of worship together. So, And I realize that there are those of you, there, there are those of you who you won't be listening because you're not on Facebook. And that's okay. We understand this sermon should be posted on YouTube by 1 p.m today if my technology works so have a super day and it's been great being with you and oh we have a note from uh the uh oh from the, yeah from the yorks uh marilyn and morales uh, i cannot get these names right here marilyn and morris i want to fuse their names together you know they are married they are one so uh but anyway they are they are watching and they and they're they're, they're saying hi and uh, we're getting greetings from them. It's awesome to hear from you, Marilyn. Say hi to to Morris for us and uh, we're praying for him. And it's just it's just grateful to be able to connect with you through this time. So blessings as you finish your day in this worship session out. Let me turn this off. Finish. <laughs>